So if we look at finite repeated games, that's where we know that there's an end to it. Now there's variations on finite because you could know it's going to end. So in a football game, you know that there are four quarters and you know there's the end. So that affects your strategy. But what if you don't know the end? You just know that at some point it's going to end. So you're playing today not knowing if it's your last or not. The idea of an uncertain final period, again, using the payoff diagram that we've seen previously. So we know that if there's a probability that there is this is the last game, that would affect your decision. And if you don't know, then you have to act as if it's going to continue. What happens is we'll then use the same approach as we would under the trigger strategy. In other words, we can try to collude and have it have us both be high high at 10 10 and we know that if there's a triggering event the we, we would then sink back into the nash equilibrium at zero zero so with an uncertain number of total periods the approach we just did with the one shot and achieving nash or looking at collusion possibilities would work the next scenario is still a repeated game but where there's a known end of period in this case, the competitors would choose the Nash equilibrium. And there's only one in this case, which is at, at zero, zero for a low price for both firms. And collusion can't work because in that scenario, the other party would choose low price and renege anyway. And that particular dynamic causes no agreement to be possible because if A were to say to B, let's collude, B would be thinking, wait a minute, if I collude, you're going to go low and there's no punishment mechanism because it's end of period. And that's why this will sink back to our original position of Nash equilibrium with both firms A and B selecting a low price. There are some applications to this end of period problem. One is related to resignation and quits. So this is an example of a finite scenario. And when you leave, it's known your last day. So the temptation is to be lazy once you resign or quit because the threat of firing doesn't affect you. You're already leaving. So punishment is not effective. Therefore, you might choose to take the easy route. However, the company can and should mitigate their risk by continuing to be useful to the employee even post-retirement. This could be in references, recommendation, or even rehiring. And if that's the case, then the employee has a stake in the performance, even though the employee knows that they have made an announcement to leave because even though they've announced they're leaving, their behavior is still being watched and may impact the magnitude of assistance and benefit in the future from the employer. So you'll see that very often companies do that as a matter of policy and goodwill to treat their former employees quite well, which threatens the other side, where if the employee does not behave well, then those future benefits would not accrue to the employee who left on bad terms. The second scenario is what is called a snake oil salesman. And imagine somebody rolling into town, selling snake oil, making any promises to get people to buy that elixir. And they know that it doesn't matter if it doesn't work because by the time the customers know it doesn't work and come back to badmouth you to other people in the town, you're gone, you're on to the next town. So the idea of uh, the traveling salesman approach is is it only one shot deal or are you going to see these people continuously? And if you are selling to the same city time after time, then you have a high consequence of breaking a promise and selling a bad product, right? That punishment inf inflicted by your disappointed customers now have a hurt on you because you're not going to another town. So that's an example of punishment in the area of having effect or not on the behavior of, in this case, the salesman.